Hey, how are you? Now, as you may know, I've been sharing stories, observations and learnings from my career on LinkedIn. And I've been really humbled by the feedback I've had and how they have helped so many people. Following on and with encouragement from friends and family, I've arrived at this point of hosting my own podcast, which for someone who has spent his career in radio and audio firmly outside the studio, this is scary new territory, but here goes. The For Real podcast is a series of conversations with colleagues and friends from the world of radio, audio and communications, who I admire and respect, and have helped, supported and inspired me and many others over the years. They will share great stories, insight and learning to help you find your real voice, your authentic self, and the confidence to own it. But before we get going, I want to thank my producer Alex Healy and my mates here at Distorted for hosting me in their fantastic studios in Leeds. Finally, it might be the odd effing and jeffing, but after all, this is for real. Hey you, how's it going? Thanks for joining me, I really appreciate your time. My passion, my purpose, I suppose, is a quest for authenticity. I could wax on about the lack of authenticity in public life, particularly in the hypocrisy of politics and increasingly in a lot of so-called journalism. I dislike the effect social media can have on people. It's overtaken the glossy celebrity magazines for imposing superficial role models, if I can call them that, where the impressionable and vulnerable are measuring themselves inappropriately with devastating mental health consequences. But I equally find myself somewhat at odds with how words like authenticity get hijacked by organisations to the extent that they become platitudes that cease to have any meaning. Ironic then that I should have decided to create a podcast series about something that has become so distorted. What I hope to share with you is what authenticity means in my world. It's about being real and relatable, a mantra that Mike Cass has espoused all his professional life and he talked so eloquently about in episode two. Being real is not always easy for many of us. It makes us vulnerable at the same time. Far more comfortable to create a persona, an alternative image of you that when criticised, you can shake off more easily as you say to yourself, it's not really me. I did it for many years, the old fake it until you make it thing. Problem is, how do you define making it? Usually it's some material measurement of wealth, status and lifestyle. And frankly, it's bollocks. I didn't make it. The only thing I made was to make myself unhappy, resulting in medication and counselling. The best decision I ever made was accepting I had a problem, talking to two friends and family and seeking help. And I urge you to take that step if you're currently struggling. A lot of my problems stem from imposter syndrome, which I'd created for myself after decades of faking it. And it's still something I can be plagued by, but I manage it a lot better now. A gift that counselling gave me. Indeed, I procrastinated about producing this podcast series directly because of imposter syndrome. However, if I want to help you or anyone else listening to this, then my guest today is the most inspiring, courageous and beautiful soul to have quite literally changed virtually everything about their life in their personal and almost unbearably painful quest to become their real self. Stephanie Hurst is the real deal, let me tell you. Her story is awe-inspiring and she's here to share just a bit of it with you. Hey, Steph, how are you? Gosh. <laughs> Hearing that introduction, thank you very much. You yeah. are one of my favourite people on planet Earth. Oh, bless you. And um, and you mentioned um, Mike Cass in there as well. I did. Who, another one of my favourite people on this planet, incredible human being, and it, had the honour of working with you both. It was a pleasure for us. Now, we've been good friends for a long time. Long time. And we first worked together at radio at, at Minister FM in York and Gosh. then at Galaxy and Capital in Leeds for many years. You're a huge radio star, darling. <laughs> nerd. <you> ha- nerd. <laughs> yeah. Radio nerd. Oh, well. Uh, but you're hiding your true self at the time from your audience, your friends, colleagues and your family. Yeah. For those that may know, not know your story, who was the person in the world that they thought they knew? So I kind of created this this persona of of Hurst Day. Yeah. Because I was I was called Hurst because Hurst is my, you know, surname. Yeah. Um in the classroom at school I was Hurst Day. I was bullied as Hurst Day. Uh and to my listeners I I was I was Hurst Day. I just used it on the air as well. Um and and that person that they saw to the outside world looked like looked like a man. Yeah. But 
internally, I knew that my gender was was different. Dating back to when I was a, a child, you know, back to the age three or four at nursery school, they'd say all the girls go to one side of the classroom, all the boys go to the other. And I'd just go and sit with the girls because that was my natural state of comfortableness. Really? This happened time and time again. They raised it to my mum. Um, but my mum just did what she was a, you know, she was a parent of the 1980s, early 1980s and brushed it under the carpet. There was no Google. You couldn't Google this stuff. You couldn't look this stuff up. Yeah. So it was just ignore it. It's fine. Pat me on the edge. You're a boy. Have an action man. I don't want an action man. I want a Barbie. <laughs> so, you know, you, <laughs> there's all of these things. But I found radio at the age of seven. Right. And that was like, I compare it to going on holiday because the radio, you can tune around the dial or you used to be able to back in the day or an old fashioned radio. You tune around the dial and you weren't, it wasn't, you weren't dictated to what your parents listened to. You know, my mum would have the radio one at home. It might be Wogan on Radio 2 or something yeah. like that. She had Radio 1 and occasionally as well. Um, but I could I could go on holiday on my radio and listen to the World Service. I could listen to American Forces Network. I could tune around the static late at night. I lived in Barnsley in South Yorkshire, so I could get radio stations that were further afield to radio stations in Nottingham, like Radio Trent that used to be on. You know, you could really get them scratching. It, it almost became a competition with yourself to be able to kind of try and find these radio stations that you couldn't usually pick up. And could you escape into that? Yeah, that yeah. was the sticking plaster. That was the thing right. that made all of the gender worries go away because then you've got puberty that hits. Obviously, all of that is for all of us. It's a real traumatic time. Yeah. You know, it's a tough time. All the girls are developing at school and I'm going the other way. Yeah. Although I was very late with, and I've since learned that my testosterone levels pre-transition were very, very, very low. Right. Um, so obviously, and people always say to me, well, you just look at your shape and everything and your height and, you know, everything about you. You just, this is, I'm only saying, repeating yeah. what people say mm. to me. It was obviously meant to be, well, it, it, it clearly was. Because yeah. I see, this is the way I see it. And it's a very childlike way of seeing things. But sometimes biology gets drunk. <laughs> and it, it's had a few too many gins, right? It, it's been out on Lash. Yeah. And then it's got to do some cooking. And sometimes, you know, when you're a bit hungover or a bit drunk, you yeah. put things in the wrong place, don't you? Yeah. Not wrong, different places. Yeah. And uh, that's what happened with me. My brain formed opposite to the way I came, came out. Children can be born with... Limbs that are different, learning difficulties, all, a whole variation. Yeah. There's so many different variations of the human form. Yeah. And that's why we're so beautiful and that's why we're so amazing. But my brain formed opposite, but my body went the other way. And, you know, I, I did, I do say this in my public speaking, actually. I've, I've got a business called Believe Achieve. And uh, whilst I'm talking, I do say I Googled brain transplants, but they don't do them. <laughs> now, that was growing up. Uh, knowing that your your gender was not right, yeah, and all of the uh, compartmentalization that society and schooling puts you through, how, how how did you cope with that? Did you just try and shut it down, or or what? How how did you even get through when society is trying to push you one way and you know that you're uh, different to what they perceive? Well, it was it was radio. Right. Listening to more and more and becoming, I wouldn't say almost too obsessiveness about radio. Yeah. Actually obsessed. Right. I thought about it constantly. You know, my pencil case at school has got Radio Air logos on it, which is a radio station in Leeds, uh, which is now called Greatest Hits Radio. And um, it's it's next to where they film um, the soap Emmerdale. Yeah. And... Uh, Radio Air's building is still there, and I occasionally do shows for Greatest Hits Radio, and it's it's weird being back in the first, in the studio where I did my first ever radio show. It's really it's it's amazing. It's wonderful, um, but my pencil case has got DJs names on it. It's all I thought about because it made the gender stuff go away. It made the confusion, right. yeah. and I had no, I couldn't verbalize. This. I had no words for it until I discovered a lady called Caroline Cosse. And she transitioned in the 70s. She was outed by the News of the World in the 80s. She was a Bond girl, a model, and she lost literally everything. 
And she was fighting to change her birth certificate. Uh, she'd been to the Human Court of Rights in, in, in Strasbourg and uh, a group of men, all men, uh, in the court decided, no, you can't change your birth certificate. Right. Uh, and she lost, but she still carried on fighting. And she wrote a book about her life and she was on TV and she was talking about this. And I was kind of dozing on the sofa. Kind of like, mm, what's this? Oh, this sounds... And she was literally describing how I felt as a child. And this was the first time I became aware of someone else like me. So I dove off the sofa. My parents were out. I must have been off school or at school holidays. It was on a show with Gloria Honeyford, daytime television on, on BBC Two. Got off the sofa, picked up one of our video cassettes that used to be in those. Do you remember back in the eighties? <laughs> we used to not. Sometimes you didn't have video cassettes in their normal covers. Yeah, they looked like they were in books. Books, yeah, yeah, plastic like books. Plastic books. Like we've got the entire works of Dickens. <laughs> no, it's just a pirated copy of ET that my dad got from someone down the pub, <laughs> and he told me not to tell anyone at school. <laughs> Cos told everyone we've got we've got ET on pirate, <laughs> um, and tape seven disappeared because it lived under my bed. Right, and that was the only thing I had this video recording, which I still own to this very day. And did you keep going back? And watched it over and over it. again when I could. Right, and um, because my parents used to go out on a Saturday night, yeah, to the local pub, and I was instructed, um, don't play music too loud, don't annoy the dog. And don't burn the house down. That's literally what I was told. She didn't tell me, Mum. Simple instructions. Simple instructions. She didn't tell me not to go into a wardrobe and put her clothes on, right. which I did constantly. Right. I used to walk around. I'm from a council estate in Barnsley called Atherton North, and um, I used to walk around our block in my mum's 1960s wig and her clothes in the late 1980s on my own late at night. How did that feel? Amazing. Yeah. Just the the, the th almost like a release. Yeah, a release, but yeah. the fear as well, the yeah. the absolute fear that I was going to get caught. Um, wow, I was terrified, but also ecstatic and the release, because yeah. this wasn't something that I was doing behind a you know closed bedroom doors. This I needed to be me. Yeah, uh, alongside you know learning my craft of of doing my radio show. So you know I used to have a little studio set up in my bedroom. I have got no recollection of getting up from my little table that I had, walking into my mum's bedroom and going out in her clothes. No recollection. And did you ever nearly get caught or seen? No, I never got caught out. My mum accused my dad of wearing her clothes a few times. Right. To which I heard a few arguments about, which, you know... There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, yeah. it's up to you if you want to, whatever you want to wear. Yeah, do what you like. Um, but yeah, my mum did accuse my dad and I thought, oh, I'm going to get caught here. I'm going to get caught. And I didn't get caught uh, until I revealed to my mum one day when she got home from work, I was fully dressed in her clothes. How did she take that? She just said to me very calmly, go upstairs and get changed and we'll talk about it. And we spoke about it. And she says, I know, I, I know you, you're struggling with this, aren't you? But she didn't know what to do. There was, as I yeah. mentioned, there was no internet. There was nothing. So I went to my GP. I mean, you were having your own torment. You're living through this yourself. Yeah. And your mum must have been like, oh, what is this? How do I cope with this? What is yeah, it? What do I do? do? What do I she say? Didn't, she didn't know what to do. Bless her. So, and I told her, don't tell my dad. Don't tell my dad. Don't tell my dad. Mm. And uh, she didn't, actually. I don't think she did. She's no longer with us and neither's my dad. Um, but I threw myself into radio because I went to see my GP when I was 17. It's about a year later or something like that. I just passed my driving test. You get a bit more confident when you, you've got that bit yeah. of freedom, haven't you? Yeah. You can properly go on holiday, can't you, in, the, in your car, go to coast. And um, I remember one day really struggling and I went to see my GP and he said to me, I told him how I felt. And uh, he said, a strong, it was something along the lines of, I strongly recommend you don't take this path in life. You'll lose family, friends, and you won't have a successful life or something. And I got oh, out of word. the doctor's surgery, got into my car, my Vauxhall Nova, which I still own to this very day, and sobbed my heart out. I made a decision there 
and then that I need to make it in radio because this is the only thing that makes it go away. For some, it's I will get married, start a family, distraction. I will go and join the army. I'll do something ultra masculine. I'll do something to make this go away, go away because it's a distraction. And my distraction was was radio. I was obsessed. So you go from sobbing in the Nova, which you still have, and I see a lot about it on uh, on Instagram. On, on my socials. <laughs> <laughs> and you carve out the most wonderful career in radio. You achieved what you set out to achieve from that moment sobbing in the car. And then, I mean, I could list your achievements to this day oh, in, in what you've done, but we haven't got enough time. But if, if looking at that, you carved out this great career and then you make a decision that you're going to be your true, true self. Was there one trigger event or a series of circumstances that made you decide to do that, to open up? There was, I guess, there wasn't one trigger event. It was the realization that this wasn't, this wasn't going away. Yeah. No matter what I did. And you know, you have all the plaudits, you have all of the amazing stuff, you know, you have to put a shelf up because we won a load of awards and, you know, they're all, it's amazing and, and wonderful to, to have all of that. But that becomes your job. It becomes your, your, and radio was never a nine to five for me. It was, it was 20, your life. It was my life. Yeah. It was 24 hours a day, constantly thinking about the show, always. Um, we used to call it the 24 hour radio show. As soon as social media exploded, you know, we the show would be on six till ten. Yeah. But we'd be on socials during the day, building this new social media thing. Which, which, which that commitment, that passion, that obsession yeah. is what drove you to the the heights. Mm. That, with your natural talent and gift to be able to oh, communicate, sure. took you to that height. But also, committing all that time of it was suppressing who you really were. Yeah, and I'd had a, a really lengthy relationship um, that had been through a few on-off periods and stuff. And, you know, I still, I think, still to this very day feel, I feel awful the way I treated that person. But I had to press stop on it. Yeah. Because I knew that I had to go and experiment and be me. And I knew that... Of course I wanted to get married. Of course I wanted to have children um, with a... It feels weird talking about, you know, having relationships with, mm. with women because I, I, you know, I now have relationships with men. But then again, I think human beings are attracted to... We can be attracted to anyone. Yeah. It's about the soul of a person, isn't Absolutely it? Absolutely right. Um, but I do like the strong arms of a man and a, a bloke protecting you. I just, I like, I like that. Although us girls can protect ourselves as well. Um, but... You know, I did, and she was, she would have been the absolute perfect, perfect partner, wife, companion to have a family and raise a family with and be with for the rest of my life. Yeah. But I was so messed up, so messed up. And I just didn't want to drag her through all of this. And she was amazing with all of this. I can't imagine the conflicting I, I, emotions and she I, I, You know, she was, she knew about all of this. She was cool with it because it always came with a caveat. Because I told her about this years, like years before. And I always said to her, it, and with anyone I told who I had relationships with, I was always very open about it. It always came with a caveat. Don't worry, I will, I will never do anything about it. It's just something right. I deal with. So if I go through a, a real dark period, like the, you know, the, the black dog above us, as we yeah. talk about in mental health, um, and those dark clouds, I would have those real dark moments and periods. But I obviously had to go to work and entertain the next day. Yeah. So I got to a point in my relationship where I was like, I need to press stop on this. And there was, there was one day, all the windows were open in the house. There was a breeze blowing through. It was lovely. And I'd, I'd ended the relationship and then panicked and got into another couple of relationships. She panic. Yeah. But there was one day a breeze was blowing through the house and I thought, I, 
I'll get a new sofa. I'll get a new car. I'll get a new cat. It used to freak the cat out when I used to, because I, when I had shaved head, when I used to put a wig on and come home from work and get changed. The cat used to hide under the bed. Oh. I think I looked that bad. <laughs> <laughs> it used to scare Dave, my old cat, bless him. Oh, Dave. <clears throat> and um, he was a stunt double for Felix. <laughs> bless him. And um, yeah, so, and I decided then and then I need to do something about this. And then, of course, I buried it again. Right. And then I went out for lunch with my friend Kate. And I told her about this around the time when I first went to my GP when I was 17. We were both at college together. She was studying, studying journalism. I was doing BTEC Media at Bouncy College. And um, I told her about it. And we'd never spoken, we'd not spoken about it for years. And we'd arranged a lunch and stuff. And we went to All Bar One at Millennium Square in Leeds. And then she brought it up in conversation. She went, I saw something on the news about gender stuff the other day. How do you, do you still struggle with that? I went, I just want to die. Wow. I can't, I can't do this anymore. You uttered those words. Yeah, just because I'd tried to take my life several times. No one knew. Oh, the amount of Googling I did and the amount of looking stuff up. We talked about the Vauxhall Nova. That was being restored. The plan was to get the Vauxhall Nova back because it doesn't have a catalytic converter. I do apologize here if there's it because this could be quite triggering. So, but my my plan was to get the car back. And because it didn't have a catalytic converter, I could sit in the garage and that would be the end of me. And I'd be in my car. Um oh there's 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 yeah. There was a few attempts and yeah. So Dark and Kate, times. Kate said to me, please go and see GP. So I said, I went years ago, you know, and I will lose everything. Cause a friend of mine had transitioned about seven or eight years before. And she said to me, you have to be prepared to lose everything. This was after a night out in Manchester. And we'd hired one of those apartments that you can hire for the night. And it had quite a big windowsill. So we were both sat on the windowsill at like two in the morning. And I think this is when iPods had first come out and she had Sade's album on from the 1980s. So that was playing in the background. And um, we were just chilling after a night out. And I'd be my true self in, in Manchester, probably down Canal Street or something in a safe space. And she said to me, you have to be prepared to lose everything. And I wasn't prepared to lose everything. So I, you know, I said this to Kate in all bar one. And she says, please just go. I said, I'll lose everything. I can't lose everything. I can't, I've worked so hard for all of this all my life. I can't lose it. Because I'd see the daily newspapers. I'd be in the studio in the morning doing the breakfast show. And you'd see the newspapers. And there'd be a headline, gender bending freak, sex change Charlie. These are very outdated and offensive terms these days. Yeah. And it would always be a, a very, a, a, a bad side profile photo of someone. Mm. And the story would be very negative that they'd lost everything because that's what the general mainstream media wanted to push. Yeah. That portrayal that if you were to transition, you're a freak and you're on the bottom rung of the ladder in the world of, in society, mm. in the world of acceptance. So she pleaded with me, just go to the doctors. So just to shut her up, I, I went to the doctors because she made me promise to take a photo of, do you know when you go to your local doctor's surgery, they write down the appointment on a sleep yeah. of paper, don't they? She made me promise to take a photo of that and send it to her. And then she obviously put the date in her phone and I got a message that morning going, don't forget your appointment today. It was like a week and a half later. And it was like 4.30 in the afternoon. I'd been up for 12 hours already because I'd done the breakfast show that morning. And... Um, I turned up early for the appointment in the car park and had a power nap. I'm just about to impart the information to my GP that, you know, this is how I feel. And um, anyway, I went in, told her, she went, well, I know quite a lot about this because three people in our village have transitioned. I'm going, where? I've not seen them. Where? Because you don't see people that have transitioned. Yeah. They just get on with their lives. Yeah. So she referred me and I was seen, this is back in like 2010, something like that, 
2011 or something. And I was seen before, I guess, the the rush in some respects of now. I mean, I was seen within, I think there's a 17 week period from referral that you've got to right. be seen. I was seen within seven weeks and I was in the system and I was having psychotherapy. Right. Do you know how long it is now between by going from your GP to getting your first appointment at the gender identity clinic? Go cool. on. Three to five years. Wow. You were seen in seven weeks. This is because there's what more the, awareness now. More yeah. people are going, I feel like that. Yeah. And I need help. And whether transition is right for them or not. They need help. You know, they just want to talk. Yeah. They want psychotherapy. They want to speak to a gender identity identity specialist. Yeah. Um. And I, I remember saying to them, can you just give me a pill? Can you just give me something to make it go away? Because I don't want to lose my career. I don't want to lose everything. Just give me something to make it go away, please. And um, she went, well, it doesn't kind of work like that. It's, it's you know, your, your, you know, the, your brain is, I think, I can't remember the exact words, but, you know, I've, like I always say, as I mentioned earlier, the brain forms opposite, essentially. Yeah. And um, the only way to kind of um, make this easier for you to to continue, you know, is 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 transition, you know, but you have to decide whether that's right for you. And I think after I was diagnosed sometime later with gender dysphoria, that was the point where I had to make a decision. And, and what that, year was that? That was 2012, 20, right. yeah, 2011, 2012. So we were working together at that point and I, yeah. the show was at its peak. What was it? 1.3, 1.4 million listeners. It was huge. Biggest commercial radio station outside London. This thing was huge. It was so dominant. It was unbelievable. And I, we did work together at that time. Yeah. But in asking this next question, I'm going to pretend that we didn't. Okay. What was the impact on your career? That that fear when you told everyone and, and, and your friend had said, you've got to be prepared to lose everything. You get to that moment. You like inform work. I put it off time and time and time again. I kept putting it off because I was terrified. I ended Understandably. Up, I ended up going back to the doctors because I was severely bloated, unnaturally bloated. And I know you say in the start of the podcast that sometimes there's some fruity language. I'm only going to say shit, so I'll say it again. Um, I was literally shitting myself. Yeah. I was so bloated with stress. Some people deal with stress in, in different yeah. ways. I bloat. Right. And I was I was I was literally shitting myself. I was terrified that I would lose everything. So the only way to kind of deal with this is to press stop myself. If I'm the one that presses stop on this, I'm in control of it. Because I think you can't do a daily breakfast show. And transition. I didn't think you could because, as you well know, and listeners may not know this, the, our old show, which was called Hursty's Daily Dose, the show was more about the audience than us. Yeah. There was three of us, a lady called Jojo uh, and, and another guy called Danny. And the show was more about the audience than us. Yeah. And it was all very self-deprecating because that's my style of a broadcast. Yeah. I, always, I always put myself down. I always used to, what was the line? Like, Lower your expectations. <laughs> It was always that, you know, our shonky show. And, and um, so I thought if I, you know, do a daily show and transition, it's, it's can I do it? It's going to be more about me than the show. And I've done the show for what? It was 12, 11 and a half years, 12 years or something yeah. like that. We'd had a good run. Yeah. And I think we were all tired. So I decided it was time to press stop, which was terrifying. Had some time out. Went to LA for a bit, as you do, and um, yes. and came back. Bit different to going to the coast in the Nova, isn't just it? a little bit, yeah. But it was nice. Um, my friend was spending some time out there, so he um, he said, "Come on, come out." So I spent some time out there, and it was nice. It's just what I needed. Came back, and then I um, I worked with an incredible um, PR agency called Carver PR and um, 
kind of put a strategy together because I yeah. needed to meticulous. We needed to meticulously manage this because if I needed to control and, and manage this the best I could, because yeah. I wasn't going to lose everything. Yeah. And anyone listening to this now who is going some going through something and it is traumatic and you feel like you're going to lose everything, you're not. You just, I just didn't want to be like a bull in a china shop with this. Yeah, and, and, and for you, I mean, it, it almost sounds a bit crass for me to have asked the question, what was the impact on your career? And, and, and I lost everything. Yeah. But your career was largely what you'd been living for. It, it, it'd been your comfort blanket, mm. what had protected you all of that time. So the thought of losing that would must have been just so frightening. You'll know that um, we got offers. Yeah. Quite a lot of offers to, to you know, to leave. Yeah. Galaxy and, and Capital and and you know, you know, radio stations would. Someone once said to me they would walk over hot coals to have you on their station yeah. because as you know, so f you know from your. I never liked real radio. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what they did? Actually, they bought me. They had a fully sung jingle at the top of the hour that sung the weather. Some weather and it had your name check it and it, they actually got me a jingle song to entice <laughs> me to come over, which I still have, which was lovely. Yeah. <laughs> um that was one nil to me though, <laughs> <laughs> But um but people would yeah, companies would walk up because we were a commodity, weren't we? You'll yeah. know from you know, we made the company more profitable. Yeah. You know, we were like a, a light bulb, we were shining bright. Yeah. And for as long as that shines bright, you know. Yeah. So um I, I, you know, I, I, I knew this, but after I'd announced everything, the industry applauded. I'm not saying it rejected me. It most certainly didn't. The support, love and warmth I got from the entire British radio industry was incredible. I did an interview at the radio festival in Salford um, a few days after I'd announced it. I did this interview on, on Five Live, which I'm sure we'll come yeah. to. Um, and uh, and did this interview and the entire radio industry, you know, the powers that be that were at the festival stood up and clapped and clapped and clapped and clapped for what seemed like an eternity. And the love I felt was incredible and the support, but the phone didn't ring. Yeah. That says everything. Yeah. I think what the industry was doing was just going to, Sit back and see what happens here. For Real with Roger Cutsworth. Go beyond the crash diet. Fight further than the fitness plan. To change your body for life, change your lifestyle. With The Wellness Mentor, you can benefit from years of experience in healthy eating, exercise and mindset. Expert guidance in nutrition, motivation, body image transformation. Take control of your well-being and make changes that last. To find out more, see thewellnessmentor.co.uk. Make a change. Make it last with The Wellness Mentor. Your space to create. Your place to focus. Your room to come together. The Hive, where ideas come to life and businesses flourish. Hot desks, offices and meeting rooms for whatever your day requires and whatever your business needs. Ideally placed just off the M62, minutes from Wakefield and Leeds. Your flexible working space. To book your space and to find out more, see thehivewakefield.co.uk. The Hive, where business comes together. Handcrafted celebration cakes, made with the freshest of free-range ingredients. Baked with care and attention, beautifully designed and sculpted by our master cake decorator. Whatever you're celebrating, whatever you want to say, say it with cake by Tiffany Cakes. Made with love for you to share and enjoy with the ones you love. To see our stunning designs and for an individual quote, search Handcrafted Celebration Cakes on Facebook. Say it with cake. Tiffany Cakes. For Real with Roger Cutsworth. Because you've done that interview with Stephen Nolan, as you mentioned on Five Live, revealed so much, shared your story with the world, and as well as the radio industry being so supportive, the public were as well, largely, weren't they? The, the yeah, outpouring yeah, of love and affection was amazing. Z like, literally, and not that anyone, not that anyone should have any hate yeah. at all, but literally zero. Yeah. You got the odd comment, but 
It wasn't, it was just, and no one should ever have any hate, ever. I can't understand why someone wants to tap nasty things into a keyboard. Neither do I, and that goes to the point I was making before with, you know, those kind of keyboard warriors on social media, et cetera, but that's probably a, a story for another time. Yeah. You got all of that love from the industry, from the general public, and um, the phone stops ringing. You and go into that kind of time where you must have been thinking... Squeaky bum time. Yeah, what next? What do I do? Mike Cass had said to me um, prior to transition, and I do apologise if, if I'm jumping around timeline-wise, Mike was in Australia at this time and was counselling me via Skype long before Teams wow. and Zoom and really helped. And he said something to me one night. I remember the laptop being on my bed because the time difference, he was in Australia. It was late at night here in the UK. Um, the fan was really wearing because it was it was in my quilt. A lot. I've all even in summer months. I've still got a thirteen point five tog duvet rocking. That doesn't surprise. I me. love a big. I love my bedding. I really <laughs> love. You know, I'm I'm a big look. It's where you spend eight nine hours a night. You know, it's got to be nice. I like my bed. And um, I always remember the fan wearing and Mike saying to me, "You could save a life, not lives, a life." And that really made an impact to me. So I thought by being visible and being public, because I was I was quite happy to go into the background, actually, I yeah. think. But by being visible and being public and doing my job, that will send a ripple effect out and help other people. Hence doing interviews like this. I don't, I do interviews about this. It's not often, as you know, yeah. it's, you know I, but I will do them. Um. But if I could just do my job and just do a radio show and not mention it, wouldn't that be amazing? But the phone's not ringing. And then one day a conversation happened um, with a lady called Kate Squire at BBC Radio Manchester. Thank you, Kate. I owe you everything. And I know I've said it to you a million times on text. I know I always say it to her, I always say it to her, I owe her, I owe everything. She put me back on the air and I was crap. You think you were crap, but... You, you, I know but, I, was, I was crap. But you're back on the air, you're back where you always wanted to be. No, I was and, crap. And <laughs> it was, and Raj, it was rubbish. It was horrible. And the reason why is because... It just sounded like a falsetto, high-pitched, false version of what you used to get on Galaxy and Capital. It was horrible. Right. Because what I didn't appreciate, for me, it was all about aesthetics, changing, you know, get myself looking like I should do, like I see myself. But I didn't realise the voice is a very important thing about broadcasting, isn't it? It's mm. really important. So I get back on the air. I do the first show. And... um I drive back listening to the iPlayer long before BBC Sounds and I'm listening back to the show and I pull over because I can't see the road for tears. I cannot, I just cannot. I'm, I'm heartbroken what I'm hearing. And every week I was heartbroken, but I was, I was trying. And what a lot of people don't realise is, although men and women use the same words, you know, yeah. we do form them differently. We'll use them in different ways, you know. And I didn't realise that. I didn't take that into consideration. So with an amazing speech therapist, I used to write down my... When you're on the radio, it's called a link. You're usually linking two items yeah. together, whether it's two songs, two news items, whatever. It's called a link. So I would sit and listen back to the show that I'd just done and the night before. And I'd sit on my dining room table on a Sunday and I'd write out two or three links that I'd already done longhand, the batum, the erms, everything. And then I would sit with my speech therapist and go, um, I need to do this again. And I would say for a good 
two or three years, I was constantly doing that. I built myself a little studio at home and used to practice constantly. Constantly practice. I was like I was like an injured athlete. For two or three years, yeah. the commitment and the drive and the determination. So you'd had this career to date uh, as Hursty, mm. that persona that you'd created with a voice, yeah. a voice that matched that persona. Yeah. You're then going yeah. into, thanks to Kate, BBC Radio Manchester, being back on, mm and having to find your voice again, not just the sound of your voice, but the identity to your voice as well. And I remember being on air once, I did a daytime shift on BBC Radio Manchester. Um, and it was lovely that I got the occasional daytime shift. I didn't, I was terrified when I was doing it. Mm. I was terrified. Because I just wanted to be tucked away late at night on a tiny show, let me find my groove again. Because it's the whole 10,000 hours thing, isn't it? Your air miles. Yeah. You know, get your air miles up. Yeah. Do it time and time and time again. You'll get better at it. But I plateaued. And it just didn't, it just wasn't sounding right. And I knew I was essentially in a box. Now, you know me vocally. I like to go all over the shop and shout and do stupid voices and go here, there and everywhere. But I was stuck in this kind of, hi, it was, it was horrible. Stuck in a box and I couldn't go anywhere with it. I couldn't do much with it. I couldn't sing anymore. I could I just couldn't do stuff with it. I was terrified. I couldn't laugh. It was a f I used to laugh inside my head sometimes. I was on the air one day and I called someone, thanks, pal. You never hear women say pal. Yeah. And I was like, that's the language is wrong. All of it's wrong. So I was like, I know you can, I know you can have surgery on your vocal cords or your vocal folds. I did some Googling and I found the guy that invented a female vocal feminization surgery in Korea. Oh, so, just around the corner. Yeah, just around the corner. So weirdly, it felt it. I got to Korea, I got to Seoul and um, I stayed in a hotel which was essentially attached to a Westfield or a, a Meadow Hall or something like that. Yeah. And I came out of the hotel and there was a Boots doing three for one on Soap and Glory in a meal deal. <laughs> and then I looked down further down, there was an All Saints with loads of sewing machines in the window. I'm like, am I, st am I, am I, am I here? <laughs> um, and then went to the, to the clinic and had surgery and then couldn't speak for like a month or something. How scary was that? Yeah, and there's also a risk with any vocal surgery yeah. that you can lose your voice or become hoarse for the rest of. But this is my this is my this is the thing. Yeah, I, I need my voice because without it, I, you know, this is how I make a living. You know, I work on the radio now, only on weekends, but I public speak with Believe yeah. Achieve. I'm a public speaker, Monday to Friday, available for hire. I have a full interactive and in demand, audio. Of, may, yeah, may I it's, tell you it's all been, very... it has gone since I quit full time radio. I, I ended up doing a, a show at BBC Radio Leeds after BBC Radio Manchester. Um, after having vocal surgery, which gave me more confidence, ended up back on the air full time and did three years there, three wonderful years, and then decided I, I, I was always doing a bit of public speaking. But I just love the fact of, you know, Hearing Nikki talk about this in episode one as well, being in front of thousands of people and just as she had that chap approach her yeah. at, at the end and as, he, as I had her head on her shoulders, you know, I have a similar thing happening to me and as, as I really connected with what she said, you know, she'd have paid them for that experience of, of that connectivity with someone and how it can change people's lives. So that... Take you back to that Skype conversation with Mike. Yeah. On your bed with the MacBook whirring away and the phone going whirring away and your 30 odd tog duvet. 13.5 tog. <laughs> <laughs> if I take you back to that and he uh, uttered those significant words, you could help save a life. Yeah. What a powerful thing you're now doing with both in terms of your. TV work, your radio work, and your public speaking. Just 
how many lives you've touched. It's crazy because it's just, I just want to help others. I really want to help others. I've always, I'm not putting myself on a pedestal or anything like that, but I've always tried to kick do the door open for the next generation. Yeah. You know, going, there's, a, there's a guy called Danny Milo who does the breakfast. We both know Danny yeah. um, and Rosie, you know, they both do the breakfast show on a radio station called Pulse One. And, um, you know, Milo, when he was 15, came and sat in on our show because I'd seen an article in the newspaper that the Yorkshire Post had done and he was claiming to be the youngest breakfast show DJ in the country at 14. Not I was like, like, get him in. Not like him Danny. In. <laughs> and then a lady called Rose worked on reception and um, and Jojo, who I was on the show with, Jojo was off on maternity. So we we kicked the door open for Rose to, she was just our receptionist, but she was funny. She turned up to do a pilot for the show dressed as a pirate. I'm here for my pirate. <laughs> <laughs> so I've always wanted to kick the doors open for yeah. the next, for ne yeah, I'm a trustee of the Radio Academy. Yeah. Helping, you know, I mentor people, you know, in radio and not in radio. I just always want to help others because my mum told me, my parents told me that, always try and help others. Don't be a twat yeah. <laughs> and help others. Yeah. Treat people the way you like to be treated. I just try and have those good values. So, so you found your real self, your real voice, and dare I say your real purpose, which is there to help yeah. others. So life must be... Incredible. So much happier Incre and better now. The thing is, I just deal with the stuff that, you know, we all have to usually deal with. You know, yeah. like, how much is it to fill your car up? Yeah. Energy prices, all of that kind of stuff. I don't have it's to... Too have bloody hot. Too, yeah, it's too hot. <laughs> By the way, if you are watching this or listening to this, it's the day after the hottest day of the year. And it's hot in and here. And it's still hot in here. Here's Nelly. <laughs> Sorry. R&B classic. Um... Yeah, so I, I just, I just, I guess I worry about the the normal mundane things in life. I don't worry about my gender. I don't worry about anything like. Occasionally, I walk past. I've got a full length mirror, not in a narcissistic way. I've just got a full length mirror in my bedroom, and I occasionally walk past it when I've not got a stitch on. Calm down, and um, <laughs> I occasionally catch myself going, oh, "I've done it. <laughs> I've done it." I still, I still can't believe I've done it. I don't know how I did it, but I it was determined. It was the Believe Achieve. And very quickly, I'll just mention where Believe Achieve came from because I, I got bullied at school quite severely, like really badly. I didn't leave for probably an 18 month period. It was hit and miss how many times I actually walked out of the front gates of the school with everyone else. Yeah. So I used to stay behind. We had a, um, a library teacher. She was our form teacher for one year, actually, called Miss Rose. And she only passed away a few years ago. She was like 102. I think when I was there, she'd stayed on past retirement. I thought you meant she was 102 when you were at school. <laughs> but she she obviously saw a vulnerability in me, so she let me used to she used to allow me to come in and and sit yeah. in library for 20 minutes after school. I was reading a book one day, and it said something along the lines of in this paragraph, and they believed and achieved or something. And now I was about 14 at this time. I'm working at Radio Air because I'd been there since I was 12 making tea for DJs, but I just wanted to be on the radio. I just wanted to do my own show on Radio Air. So I used to tap myself on the forehead with believe and point on achieve. Believe, achieve, believe, achieve, believe, achieve. Come on, believe, achieve, believe, achieve. I used to say that to myself. And then one night I got to do my own show when I was 16 and it was amazing. And then I got loads of cover work and stuff and then went to Minster, met you and the rest as we've just talked about is history. And I kind of forgot about Believe Achieve. My career was happening. I didn't need to yeah. Believe Achieve. It was happening. Just that, yeah. I was getting on with that. And then as I mentioned earlier, I lost everything. And then one day I was having a really tough day. Phone had not rang. I was like, what's my purpose? Struggling to get through this thing. And I just said to myself, come on, Believe Achieve. And it was like a little wake up. It was a little wake up call. And I just started saying it to myself, and this is the power of manifestation. If you think positively, positive things come into your life. I genuinely believe that because you attract positivity. By being positive, you'll attract like-minded people. 
I worked with someone for many years who was negative, really negative. And that started to rub off on me. And every time something bad happened, it was all woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. And I was never like that, but you start to rub off in you. You start to think in a negative way. So having that believe achieve, that was something that allowed me to really push forward in a belief system that anything is possible. Now, I'm not going to be an astronaut, you know, but I can get my career back and I, and I can share with others my story and I can, if I can empower people to use their belief system, they will achieve whatever they want to. If it's writing things down on a journal, if it's just, if it's pulling all of this energy that the universe gives us and pushing it out there and attracting good things into your life, that surely, that can't be a bad thing, can it? It really can't be. You say there that you're not going to be an astronaut. And (laughs) um, my, I don't particularly like the expression, but if we're talking about a journey, I think Mm. you've been to the moon and back several times in what you've achieved and overcoming Mm. and finding your real self and I know there's so much we could talk about and go on uh, forever as we do on the phone often. <laughs> we do have long long conversations sometimes, but the good I feel, but I come off, I, I come off feeling empowered. I speak to Mike, I come off the phone feeling empowered. And friends like that, that, that you've got around you that can make you feel uh, better about the situation mm. and empowered is such a powerful thing. Just one more thing. We have a feature uh, called the Columbo moment. Oh, yes. And it's one last thing, <laughs> as Peter Follett used to say. So that one more thing. What What's that one bit of advice you were given or one bit of advice you impart to others now? That one thing that you could share with uh, our friends that are listening now that could help them? There's many, many, many things. But the one thing I've learned as I've got older, and this is one thing I've never done, do not burn bridges. Now, even though at, the mo- at that moment, it might you may have been fired, there may have been a big fallout, but don't sever those ties. Don't. I always give people three strikes. Three strikes and you're out. Yeah. If you're a twat once, you might have made a mistake. Yeah. Second time, you might be having a bit of a bad time, okay? Yeah. Third time, you're done. See you later. See you later. But I never really sever those ties. I never really cut it off because you never know the circun- certain circumstances that might happen that that person might have to make a really tough decision. And it's not your fault. It's just it's just the way the business is moving at that time. But you never know later on down the line, that door might be kicked open again for you. Don't burn. And my dad used to say to me, don't burn your bridges. Don't piss people off on your way up. You'll meet him again on your way back down. And that for me has been really vital because I could have got angry. There's certain things I could have got really angry about and really annoyed about and bitter. I'm not a bitter person. I think it's good to forgive. Don't always forget, you know, but it's good to forgive. People make mistakes. And I always think it's really important not to burn any bridges. This industry that I work in is so small. So, you know, there's so many people that I've worked with when we were younger, they probably weren't in a good space. Now they're in a great space and they're amazing to work with. Why do I want to, you know, burn that bridge and not work with that person again who's done lots of development on themselves? Yeah. So for me, it's I, I, I don't burn bridges. There you have it the wonderful Stephanie Hurst. It's been an absolute pleasure. I know you don't do many interviews, so I really appreciate you coming in (laughs) and and talking with me. It's been an absolute pleasure. And just remember, don't burn bridges. Don't burn bridges. And can I just say thank you for all of your support. You have been a a real trailblazer for me. You've you've changed my life in more ways than you realise. Thank you. Love you lots. Love you lots.